Anyway, drones are a very interesting uh, subject. Tonight, we are pleased to introduce Larry Cunningham, who's uh, going to talk about drones, everything we need to know uh, about how to uh, utilize them. And it's a special topic here in Laguna Woods because you can't just go out and, and uh, fly your own. You've got to uh, abide by the rules. And so uh, Larry's going to talk about uh, some of that. His expertise began when he was in the military. He was a photo reconnaissance officer during the Vietnam War. And during that time, his, his lab was processing high altitude imagery that supported multi-force daily intelligence op operations. After the Air Force, Larry was introduced to high-speed, high-resolution digital imagery with multiple space-based platforms. This would be 30 years before the iPhone, Larry points out. Um, so tonight you're going to hear more about his, uh, his background and his um, expertise here tonight. We actually have a, a drone, so be sure to duck whenever <laughs> when it comes your way. Let's give Larry a hand as he uh, comes now to talk to us. Okay, Steve, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'm hoping we're not, can everybody hear me now? Okay. Um, first of all, we live in the most diverse, multi-talented community in the United States. I know of more talent here than in this concentration of residents than any place else I've lived. And oh, by the way, I was in the Air Force 12 years and had 13 addresses. So I know what I'm talking about. Also, I want to see a show of hands. How many people are pilots? Thank you. How many people are pilots? You got your 61. Okay, how many people are drone pilots? You got your 107? Come on. Yes? Good. All right. You got your 107? Very good. Excellent. And I imagine, according to Steve, there's some of you here tonight that have brought your drones, right? Yes? No? Well, I brought mine. And you're going to be on camera, and I'm going to be looking for a volunteer from the audience because we fly drones here in Laguna Woods based on the FAA guidelines. And that means two people, commercial, and it's recreational flying is not permitted here in Laguna Woods. So I'm kind of stealing the sun thunder here, but I want to get started here. Commercial meaning that you get paid for it. Commercial means that you have to have insurance. Commercial means that you file a flight plan. 250 Say again? It varies. All right, drone photography. Do we have any photographers in the room? I know one back there. Very good. What we're going to cover today is some of the instrumentation from the drone perspective that you might want to look at and consider based on what type of photography you're going to do. Everything from uh, event photography to say sports events, weddings, um, stock footage. David and I were talking about stock footage. So we're going to cover some of that to get you started. And most of you already know that DJI, a Chinese company, does own 70% of the drone market now. Um, there are more people uh, getting into the market. You're going to see parrots. You're going to see third, other third-party vendors. But most of that technology is made overseas. Um, DJI was successful because they put together the first package that was ready to fly, and that was the Phantom 1. They're now up to Phantom 4, and each one of those versions that go up have a pro model, have a row, uh, standard model, have a high, high res model, so they all have different models within, the, say, the Phantom 1, 2, 3, 4. It's a big business. You can see that it's, you know, it's in the billions, and my date is kind of old since it was 2016. We're, we're expecting that number is going to go triple by 2020. Um, drones started to mature once people found out how to use them. What, this is a tool. This is an, if you're a photographer, this is another tool in your toolbox. So photography was actually, and videography, David, were the first ways that, that drones started getting accepted 
by the, you know, by the layman. Uh, there's also a component for the much younger audience called racing. It scares the crap out of me because it is so fast. You just don't even see it. So you can see that there's a lot of diversity here, agriculture. Um, by the way, also mapping. I can show you some of the some of the mapping injury. You could, you're welcome to come up and look at this, but this is some of the mapping we've done here in Laguna Woods. Um, the mapping detail is, for those of you keeping notes, one inch per pixel. That's how the resolution we can get with that. Okay, so we're back now to how do you get an F, how does FAA require you to fly a drone, particularly in here. Let me start out just the basic rule here, and everybody I think knows it. You, there's no recreational flying here in Laguna Woods. You must be, as that gentleman back there is, as well as myself, a commercial registered FAA certified pilot. And there's a lot you have to go through to, to do that. FAA wants experienced pilots, just like if you're flying a light aircraft or a twin engine, they want to know that the people behind the controls have been through the training, that understand basic airmanship, and in our case, we have to have a different set of rules or a different set of knowledge set for the drones. There are component questions that they ask the drone people that they don't ask a standard pilot. So that's, that's the other piece of this. You have to have a Part 91 general aviation knowledge, um, and then there's the Part 101 for recreation. For, who, who, else, who are the guys here that have the drones? So you know you can't have anything over 55, 55 pounds. Uh, it can be under 55 pounds. Um, you know you have to avoid manned aircraft. I'm preaching to the choir, I know, in some cases. And you have to maintain underneath the 400 foot ceiling, AGL, above ground level. Um, although it's not mandatory, it's suggested that you register your aircraft in case it gets lost. If A knows who to call, you <laughs> find it. Um, my aircraft is registered. It's looking at you right now. And there's also a new app called Before You Fly, and it's meant for you as a recreational flyer to tell you where are the airports in my area? Because I guarantee you, I didn't know that there was a heliport within five miles of Laguna Woods. There's a, there's a heliport here out here at Saddleback. Unmanned, but now that's the good thing about recreational. The notice today is that you can fly in this G space area without having to notify tower or air traffic control. So that was, it. That was today's notice. That's how fast this is changing. Uh, the 107 uh, is the commercial license. Um, if you're already a pilot and you've got your part 61, then all you have to do is some more paperwork. There's always more paperwork. You gotta be 17 years old. And the term there at the end is visual line of sight. That means that I, as the pilot, need to keep my eyes on that aircraft. That's my job, to visually monitor where that aircraft is, monitor the risk factors, monitor the people around it. So that's my job as a pilot, VLOS, visual line of sight. That is a requirement whether you're flying recreational or commercial. There's a knowledge test required for the 107 commercial pilot. Uh, takes seventy percent to pass. You have to do it at a certified FAA facility. The one I went to is down in Long Beach. No, no, I went to the one. Um, no, I wouldn't go to Riverside. <laughs> there's one in Long Beach, and there's also another one down by LAX. Um, bring your checkbook, one hundred and fifty bucks. Also, those people that pass the test must be vetted by TSA. That's your security agency. When you go to the airport, those are the folks that are checking you. And they're gonna make sure that you're not on any kind of watch list. That might be a reason for some of, some of our younger audience to not particularly wanna go down that path. The other piece that's with this is you have to be vetted with TSA and Homeland Security. So we want people flying drones that uh, that understand the, the risk, they, under, they will take responsibility for those flights and to act responsibly. 
and TSA wants to know who you are. The license is good for two. You can retest as, as required. Um, you notice I've got insurance down here. As a 107 pilot, I have yet to have a customer not want insurance because you need, as a pilot, to indemnify this person you're that's hiring you. And you indemnify them by taking out a million dollar insurance policy that indemnifies him or his, his company. And if you're working for me, you want, you want indemnification too. You don't want to be liable for that. So insurance is almost always required by all my clients. Um, typically, they're going to ask for a million dollars or more, depending on the job. I've had people ask for 10 million. Yeah. All right. Um, let's talk about camera equipment. The cameras that first started out were pretty basic, but they got better real quick because the photographers and videographers demanded higher resolution. You're looking here at this is. Your monitor is 1080, isn't it, Tom? Okay, most of the drones now will shoot 4K because that's where the industry is going. 4K is... Now, I'm going to compare this to Micro Four Thirds. Anybody shooting Micro Four Thirds camera? David is. Micro Four Thirds at 4K is eight times more data. Think of the bandwidth, think of the data, think of the storage. So 4K, we can shoot in 4K, but most of us that work in post-production for videography or, or photography will put it down to 1080, which is your most common media right now. I don't know in my lifetime that I'm ever going to see 4K here in Laguna Woods. <laughs> Tom probably has a better pulse on that. Paul, over to... I agree. Yeah. Okay, so don't hold your breath for 4K. But I know David's already thinking about or is shooting 4K because he wants to be able to render his product for the customer that, that demands higher resolution. So the cameras have gotten a lot better. The Mavic um, Pro, Mavic 2 Pro has zoom. Matter of fact, I fly the Inspire 1. I'm flying a micro four thirds camera. My camera costs more than the drone. I'm flying also, what you see today is a zoom lens that allows me to stay back from a a group of people, and I can still photograph an event, but I can be out here, you know, like a tripod in the sky with a telephoto. And I can, I can take anywhere from 12 to 18 megapixel video. So the Phantom 4s, with one we talked about earlier, one, two, three, four, those are the, they started out at the bottom, they're mainly consumer drones, they're mainly uh, recreational. You can get some pretty impressive pictures with the, with the Phantoms. Uh, like I say here, this, the Inspire has two models, Inspire 1 and Inspire 2. The only advantage is that Inspire 2 is twice as heavy because it takes two batteries. It can fly a little bit longer. <laughs> and, um, the reason I chose the Inspire 1 rather than the Inspire 2, even though it can fly longer with two batteries, is that that platform was the only one that DJI thought of in terms of you as a videographer or a photographer. I can fly seven different cameras on that. Everything from thermal imaging, telephoto zoom, micro four thirds, you know, 4K obviously. So I chose that platform because I can fly. It's not the most advanced platform. The, the Inspire 2 and he, I saw a couple of small Osmos in here. The, the, newer, the newer drones have collision avoidance. You know, mine always requires visual line of sight. But I, I love that platform because I can fly what my customer wants. So that's the Inspire 1. So you're, we were asking about what kind of cameras and equipment are needed. The Mavic 2, which is the, the Pro, does have a zoom. It's $1,200 to $1,400, and it has a flight time of about 31 minutes. I do like the lighter aircraft because it gives me more flight time. And as a pilot, you're going to find that you spend a majority of your time scouting in terms of getting to the right location because your producer, your director is gonna want a specific shot. So I like the, I like the, the flight time for those. Uh, the Inspire, which is a little higher cost because it can run the seven different platforms, has about 25 minutes. And everybody asked me, how far can they go? I said, they can go out of sight. 
but the FAA requires me to keep watching it. So how high can it go? It can go out of the sight. And that's why you don't want to be in somebody's flight path, whether it's London, Heathrow, or New York, or down here, John Wayne. And that's the typical thing that happens. The youngsters get this under the Christmas tree, and grandpa's out there watching, hey, Johnny, how high can this thing go? And that's, that's what happens. Now, the company that makes this, not all of them, has started to put ceiling limitations. 400 feet, you remember, was my AGL, above ground level. That's my requirement by FAA. They've started putting that requirement in that you have to unlock it in the software on the, on the, uh, on the drone to be able to fly above that. You can still be at 1,000 feet and, and fly 400 feet above the ground level, even if you're at 1,000 feet. That You can still do that. And people say, oh, well, you know, uh, four, 200 feet or you know, 400 feet, that, there's no problem as long as you're below that. I've actually had, and I'll, I'll look at the pilots when I tell them, I've actually had an altimeter fail on my drone. As soon as I started to take off, it went to what it thought was the altitude. The altitude was minus 694 feet. So it was going to ground level. I had to bring it down. So you say, oh, accidents can't happen? They always do. That's why you're always watching that aircraft. So you can fly this thing um, for great distances beyond what you can see. However, the FAA does not like people sitting there with binoculars watching, um, watching your drone fly out of sight. I hire a second person to act as my observer. When we shot in the Arboretum six months ago at night, I had to have four observers. Those were people that monitored the aircraft, monitored the crap, monitored the people that were there, made sure we were safe. So I had four observers that night. Night flying is a whole different ballgame. But my Inspire did really good. Um, as I said earlier, almost all of these new platforms will do 4K video. Some things you might want to be thinking about. Um, whether you're primarily, as David and I are already into photography or videography, do you do weddings, soccer events? Everybody here's got grandkids and some uh, baseball, soccer events. With that vehicle and the zoom lens, I can put that tripod up in the sky. And where's your action? If you're a producer or director, the action's on the field. That's where your kids are. They're playing the game. So you don't need a lot of movement of the drone over the crowd. As a pilot, you need to be where they are because there's always somebody walking up late to the game. <laughs> so events, uh, night photography, uh, be more than glad to come back and do another whole session on night photography. It takes a special waiver, as you've already, I've already told you, uh, to fly night, you have to have really good eyes. Matter of fact, on the back of that, I have a strobe, and that strobe believe it or not, is very helpful when it gets out even you know, half a mile. That strobe at night is invaluable. And that's why the FAA requires it. It's all for a reason. You know, it sounds like mother over, hit, over watching you, but it's, it's there for a reason. We do get a lot of folks that want to do real estate here. And that's where the quick, oh, can you, run, can you shoot this for 50 bucks? Not really. Not really, because my insurance is going to cost that to fly and indemnify the company, indemnify the owner of the property. So the real estate is, is a very big demand for drone. There's a lot of people out there illegally doing that. Mapping, um, I, I encourage any of you that are interested in either agriculture mapping or mapping. Um, I have maps photos that we've done, maps here of Laguna Woods. You're welcome to come up and look at that. Uh, I'll restate the resolution for those of you. We can get, in the, in the digital raw image, we can get one inch per pixel. Let that soak in for a minute. Okay, so mapping, um, the other, what kind of camera is required? Depends on who your customer is, what does he want? Um, what kind of budget does your customer have? There's flight range limitations. 
Some cameras, I have another camera that I put on this that weighs half of what that camera weighs. So when I put on another camera, I have less weight, I can fly longer, I can take longer to get to the locations that I need to. So flight range is, is a factor in doing that. You notice that for those of you who do have drones, almost everybody's going to what they call intelligent flight modes. They have a canned set of maneuvers that are built into the software that allow you to plan a mission, save it, then when I get out in the field, I can call that same mission up and I can fly it out in the field using GPS and using Google Maps. The great part about that is if I've got a customer that I'm working with now, that if they want to fly the same thing in the winter, summer, and fall, I can fly that same, that same flight pattern again because I can save it and we can repeat it. That's part of the intelligent capture modes. And there's more, more modes in here. They've got things called uh, zip line. They've got uh, POI, circular POI, making, making a trip around it. So there's more. We could spend a whole week on that. The other thing that I find and is that guy's not very portable. You probably saw the battery bag that I brought in here. The Phantoms are great because you can put them on your backpack. The even smaller ones now, the, Inspire, the, the newer Sprint, what do they call it now, Sprint? The small one that you can almost put in your pocket. Portability is, if you're a hiker and a backpacker, portability is a big issue because with that comes weight. You have to have batteries, cards, um, so you, the smaller, the lighter, you, you, you know the drill. So portability does become uh, a, mo a pretty good issue for those of you that do want to do. Um, when and where are you flying? And this is going to be driven by the event that your, your client wants. Here in Laguna Woods, uh, I'll recap saying there's no recreational flying. Here in Laguna Woods, you can fly with a, with a 107 license if you do several things. One of those has to be that you have to be under the employ of VMS. VMS says, oh, Larry, I want you to cover the 4th of July event. Okay, so I have to indemnify them, take out my insurance policy. I also have to file a flight plan, a flight plan that shows where my aircraft will be, and that goes to security here because they need to brief their teams when we have major events like this, where are the drones going to be? Where are people going to be? So I file a flight plan, million dollars plus insurance, and I work with security to make sure that they know we're on the grounds, you know, and what our flight schedule is. So flying here is purposeful. It's meant to be responsible. It's meant to be safe for the residents. We're not up there to look in your window. Yes, and I'm probably thinking, well, okay, well, he said one pixel per inch. Oh, okay, that, that's not, the, no, that's not our role here. Um, we did go out to the towers with, where the beautiful three-hole golf course is. That's a gorgeous shot from the drone. But the, but the towers people, uh, they've got windows. They, you know, they're looking out there. What's, what's this drone doing out here? So we are under contract when we do fly here. And as a commercial pilot, this other gentleman back here has got a 107. Uh, you can be hired. I've had the radio club come to me and ask me, Larry, can you, f we want to check out our, our emergency disaster preparedness antenna. Can you fly that? I said, yeah. You want to buy, it? you want to pay for the insurance and have, have me contracted through VMS. So there are, there are avenues here where you can fly a drone here for meaningful purposes. This is, Laguna Woods is not designed to be a recreational drone area. Matter of fact, I go off campus, meaning anywhere off of Laguna Woods, to do my flight test. Every time I have a change in software, and is there anybody here who's got an iPhone, an iPad, a Windows machine? How often do you get software updates? Okay, would you think that Boeing should have had those pilots test MCAS before it? Okay, that's what I do every time I get a software. I go off campus, I go fly, make sure that I understand what those changes were to my aircraft. So that's what, what we as pilots all need to do. 
safety first. Um, I'm stating the obvious, but you don't want your aircraft over hovering over people. And that's why, again, the choice of equipment you pick, the telephoto lens, standing back away from the crowds, always is a good thing to do. FAA will let you progress over, the, over a, a group of people, but not hover. You know, it's not like you can go to the stadium where, where uh, the rock stars are and sit there and hover over the, the people in the, in, in the audience of state. It's not intended for that. You'd have to get special permission to do anything around a stadium. There are area-specific rules, and the most common thing that most of you guys are going to do, you're going to forget your SD card because they're so small now. They're, they're like that. 256 gigabytes on a cartlet that size. Um, always take lots of batteries. Make sure everything's charged up. Uh, as I said earlier, getting to the location, depending on what you're flying, takes a good portion of the flight time. I recommend you shoot raw. And for, particularly for us that live out here on the coast, neutral density filters are a must. You want to bring out that sunlight. You want to bring out that beautiful color. That's, that's the, uh, the role of the neutral density filters. Okay, I have a group of references, and I'm not going to stay there and look at that very, very much. Those of you that want to, I, I can get you references later on. But I do have one other thing that we're going to do. Anybody want to volunteer? I need a volunteer. I need a volunteer. Don, come on over. So what we're going to do now, I have, I've had the drone here watching you all, all your beautiful smiling faces as you come in. Don's going to be my cameraman, and I'm, you know, obviously we're not going to put the propellers on, we're not going to fly and take off, but we are going to set up and use the camera. He has a, he has a separate control for the camera, and the pilot has a separate control. And those of you that fly, you recognize that why we identify this as the pilot's controller. Okay, Don? I'm here. Okay. Now, you remember when your grandkids were doing all of those uh, video games? I do. Were you paying close attention? No. Oh, <laughs> because you have control of the camera. Here, you can go left, right, up, down. Did it move? Okay, so Don's going to be our camera operator. He's got the hard job because all I have to do is get the aircraft into a position that he can, so I'm already there. So now, Don can take pictures, he can uh, shoot video, the uh, two buttons here, you can try it for a still shot. Go ahead and pick it up, grab a hold of it. There you go. So he's driving the camera. This is what FAA wants us to do. Yes, sir. Oh, oh, I thought we had a fan for a minute. So the FAA wants us as commercial pilots to have the pilot focused in on flying the aircraft. And that's my job. That's why I have the red flag. I don't want to pick up the wrong controller and try and control the aircraft with his, because he can't control the aircraft. He controls the camera. He's there to take the pictures, take the video. Don can take a, a 4K video in motion. He can take stills. And he may say, hey, Larry, let's get a different perspective. I'll move the aircraft based on what he wants me to do. So Don's just, see, he's, uh, he's getting the hang of this. Next time your grandkids are over, you're going to have to pay closer attention here. Piece of cake. All right, right. <laughs> now, it does have an automatic focus feature. And he can, he can, I can override it. If want to, we'll focus on the folks in here. Um, so it has autofocus, it has everything you would have on your DSLR. ISO, speed, it could go to RAW, I think I'm getting out of range here. Um, so it's just like a camera on a platform that you, that's at 200 feet or 300 feet or 400 feet AGL. Okay, so uh, it also, it doesn't record audio, so speak up, you know. There's no, there's no, there's no audio with this. By the way, the audio you see when it's dumped into the channel, that's dubbed in audio. 
unless they're shooting a DSLR or another camera off-site that off, off the drone that pulls the audio in, because drones don't record the audio. It wouldn't make much of an audio anyway. All you'd hear is the propellers. Larry? Yes, sir. I notice a lag. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, there is latency. Is that, uh, but it won't show up in the recording, though. Correct. Well, I say it won't show up. Uh, it doesn't show up primarily because I, my camera and I, cameraman and I coordinate. We typically don't make moves while we're in video mode because Steve and uh, Dave, we get rolling shutter. And, and those of you that take that camera back there and try and move it real quick, and Jack's nodding his head. Yeah, rolling shutter is where the camera's moving faster than the frame rate could keep up with it. Uh, I went to the um, NAB show and they had cameras there that'll shoot a million frames a second. Don't worry about rolling shutter. <laughs> anyway, so my cameraman and I usually coordinate, but yes, there is a latency. And if you do record it, I stand corrected. If you do record it, it, it shows up in the video and it's going to end up on the editing floor. Boy, I tell you, really a professional. I've lost everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, while he's uh, getting his training wheels on here, any other questions? But I thought I don't, yeah. Yeah, that's the one person One person can, but as soon as you put your photographer's hat on, your drone's in the tree. <laughs> because we are not as multitasking as everybody says you can. I'm either photographer or pilot. And the times that I put my photo hat on, it's ended up in the tree. Yes, sir. A lot of talk about batteries. I yeah. mean, nickel metal hydrates, and can you recharge them? Yes, I can recharge them. Um, they have different capacities for the Inspire One. I have a TB47 and I'm running a TB48 now. Um, for batteries, it's all about monitoring the batteries. There are functions called reconditioning discharge. You need to pay very close attention to your children, your battery or, or your children. You need to discharge them and recharge them on, on very strict cycles. The battery actually has a computer in it. It tells me the temperature, it tells me the load it was under. I can pull all of that flight data into my, my software and I can see every time I've flown that battery, every time I've charged it, what kind of alerts and alarms and warnings. These are, these are pretty smart batteries. So yes, you can recharge that. Temperature's a big thing too. California, we're really lucky. I was in the Czech Republic last year and Burn. got the draw, yeah, it was minus 20. Yeah. You got as high as the telephone pole and then just dropped out of the sky. Normally, when they start running out, they'll come back to base automatically. But you, you bring up a good point because he's right. We do here in California live in a very you know, temperate climate. Uh, went to Canada and just like he did, uh, as soon as I got the drone partially in there, I hadn't preheated the batteries. They'd been sitting out in the garage overnight. Duh. So I found out real quick, they make a little battery socket you plug onto the, the, this, you know, this battery, and it heats it up for about 30 seconds, enough where it wakes up the battery, gets the circuits going, and does, it's not immediately under load. So yes, battery heaters are good things. His question is, how about Laguna Beach and the parks? Um, I'm going to give you my mantra. My mantra here is that the, nation, the national media has done such a great job demonizing drones that it's so much easier for municipalities, cities, governments, counties, just to throw up the no drone sign. Now, having said that, in defense of it, the FAA was so far behind the industry that cities and counties and municipalities didn't have time to catch up. As a matter of fact, I helped write the policy for in here two years ago. 
Laguna Woods is the only community that has an active drone flight policy. David. How, how much of the time do you spend using uh, like automatic exposure and autofocus versus manually controlling? We fly manual all the time. Yeah. 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 And you have time to... I just use auto for flight checkouts. Okay. Yeah. Back there. Can you give us uh, any information? Uh, you know, we read where they have these warfare drones. Uh, recently, in Saudi Arabia, they say some terrorists uh, damaged some uh, uh, petroleum uh, depots over there. Uh, can you tell us anything about those, their weights, uh, their capacity? I can relate. Unless you have one of the super big drones, most of, and, and almost everything I've seen in the crash videos from Iran, Iraq, are the phantoms. You can't carry anything much more than a package of cigarettes with that. So yes, it is probably industrial grade explosive. Yes, it can harm an individual or you know, cause damage to a group of people. But I don't see drones as having the capacity yet. I'm not talking about a drone that weighs 54 pounds, one pound under. I'm talking about the small phantoms that you see around. I don't see them as, as having the, the terrorist potential of the, instead of flying you know, a commercial airliner, obviously. So I don't see that as a, as a, yes, it can cause damage, it might blow a valve, but they're not gonna blow through a two inch thick steel oil tanker. They just don't, they can't carry the weight. Every time I change something on my aircraft, it's heavier, I fly less time, I could go less distance. So you, you have to put your pilot's hat on when you think, okay, I'm gonna be a terrorist, I'm gonna carry a bomb. Well, as soon as you take the camera off, you put high intensity explosives on it, then now you're flying in the blind. You don't even know where that is unless you have somebody you know, out there in the field doing it. So it's, it's all the physics of flying for those of you that are pilots. It's, it's not rocket science. We've been doing this for a long time. Questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. When you record an event, are you limited by your battery life? Yes, I am. Therefore, at an event, you ask yourself, how much video do I want to watch at a time? Do I want to watch 10 minutes straight? Nah. There isn't a production guy in here that'll say, you're going to watch more than 30 second clips. That gives me the opportunity to come back, put a new battery on, I want to be in place for the next event. I can film that for 17 minutes. But I guarantee you, <laughs> most of it is David would probably nod his head. It ends up on the editing floor. But yes, you can. I can. You can record solid. But it's. I'm going to leave you. Go ahead. Frequency distortion. Yes. Over water. Yes. You have that problem with fixed wing RC. Have you experienced that? I've been over water, and the frequency distortion I got was down at the San Juan Capistrano Pier. I didn't have a, we were flying great, it was at night, the metro pulls up and everybody's got their cell phone on. The video just went wild. Because we run on 2.4 and 4.8, so yes. But over raw, over just, just lake, um, I, haven't, I haven't flown that yet. But I have heard some blogs that people do that. Are you talking about the, the actual control signal or the, the video itself? I'm not worried about the video so much as uh, I am the control. The control, yeah, yeah. yeah he's, he's talking about the control signal. All right, um, I, have, uh, I have a little video that I wanted to show you that here's what a drone can actually do when we, when we put, it, uh, put it together with uh, a little presentation here. And you can switch, Tom, you're switching back over. This is Nelson's ghost town out in Nevada.
No, we actually hired this location. We had authorization to fly there. No, that's why I have a cameraman. Take a pan nice and slow, you can get a good panoramic view without a rolling shutter. His question is, uh, how do you control the height? The pilot controls the height of it, the altitude. Pilot controls altitude, roll, pitch, and yaw, just like on an aircraft. That's the beauty of a 14 millimeter wide angle lens. What frame rate? Oh, 1080 30 there. Yeah, I can, I can do 45. I'm sorry? Oh yes, everything's separate. The batteries alone cost $200 a piece. You better not go in the field without a dozen. start watching video and say, oh, that's a drone shot. And you'll see it on the news because it's it's so much more cost effective for them to for a news crew to go out with a drone rather than a, a helicopter ten thousand dollars an hour. So I did have one closing thing that when uh, I came up with Tom and uh, the guys the other day to set up, everybody kept asking me after this, well, where is Nelson Ghost Town? It is a movie production place. Um, the magicians, the, uh, Brian, whatever he is, one of the magicians had one whole section that we couldn't go to because he was filming his magic show out there. But we had uh, rented this place as a group of photographers that were doing a night workshop that I worked in with the manager to do some uh, drone work. Nelson Ghost Town. It's here on the bottom, probably where my head was, and it's that far from, it's actually just south of Boulder City. What's the mileage between where you were and where you were flying? I was asleep because the bus driver was driving. And you were at that red spot on the bottom. That's where the Nelson Ghost Town is. And you were, you were filming where? Right there. Right there. I was on site. Remember, I have to have visual. You forgot my you forgot my four rules of drone flying. I can't be in Vegas and fly this. But having said that, the other reason I picked the Inspire is I can fly this aircraft and stream live to YouTube. You have to have a. a this is what the power companies do. 
when they want someone to fly the high, excuse me for a second, they want all of these uh, big cross arm high power energy poles, they have, a, have somebody sitting on a desk connected to the Edison's uh, YouTube website and the, the pilot flies connected to he's downstreaming at live. Of course, there is lag and latency here. But then your camera guy is listening to what the producer wants. He may want a different insulator. He's looking at chafing wire over here. So that's how the high power guys do it. That's an arena I haven't gotten into yet because there's, you asked the good question about RF interference. Imagine what it's like when you run 14,000 amps of power through that stuff. So yes. You got it. The guys that don't have the zoom, they got to get up closer. What's the biggest telephoto you got on your camera? Your feet. Get closer. <laughs> but with that, I, I can zoom in. So I want to thank everybody for coming. You've been a great audience. Uh, good questions. I hope you've got a good understanding of you know flying here in Laguna Woods. And uh, you're welcome to come up and look at some of the imagery that we've shot here. And... Uh, just see the detail we'll get. Bear in mind, oh, right here, our old clubhouse two. Does anybody remember that? Get over here a little closer. Does anybody recognize the construction of clubhouse two? This was done back in those days. The print doesn't show you what the digital image is that's on the screen because you can continue to zoom in down to one inch per pixel. Anyway, come up. You're welcome to come up and look at that. We'll field any other questions. Steve, thank you so much. Thank you, Larry. That was very nice. I have a gift for you. I have a gift we give to our guest speakers that is unique. So if you see somebody with this, their their odds are they're a speaker uh, at our. So here's your very own well, thank you. video club mug. Thank you very much. I'll use this tomorrow when I'm down at the camera club because I'm also head supervisor at the camera club. So come down and see me on Thursday mornings. I'll talk drones till your ears fall off. Very Tom, good. thank you again so much. And thank you for the day. Oh, I've got a... One inch is like that. One pixel is one of the... 220 megabytes of data that's collected on the sensor. The sensor can put out 20 megabytes. So in put all the zeros like there, and one of those pixels can, with resolution. Now keep in mind, when I take this, when I do mapping, I'm not just taking one picture. To take this shot to get the resolution, I overlap many, many images together. I'll take 200 shots and overlay that. That's why I can get the resolution because I've got a canopy now that's this big and I'm looking at you know, multiple places on the ground from different angles. So it's very sophisticated. The isometrics uh, mapping is it's pretty amazing. Did you have a question? Oh, come on yeah, up. So You're welcome to come up and look at the pixel. Look at this picture element. And a picture of like this can be described in how many pic pixels across and how many pixels in. And I'd say there are a couple thousand by 500 or so. So, I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it.